The objective of this personal protective equipment course is for you to develop a good working knowledge about personal protective equipment, or PPE, including when it's needed and what components make up a typical PPE ensemble. You will also learn about the various levels of protection and when it is appropriate to upgrade or downgrade this gear. In addition, the risks of using this equipment, required maintenance, and care of this gear will also be discussed. The actual procedure for putting on and taking off PPE is presented in the donning and doffing course. Healthcare personnel risk exposure to a variety of hazards when receiving and treating individuals who may have been injured, contaminated, or made ill from exposure to a hazardous substance. Since these first receivers work at a site remote from where the hazardous substance was released, their exposure risk is typically limited to the agents carried on the victim to the hospital. In order to protect healthcare workers, Hospitals must plan for and provide appropriate training that reflects the reasonably predictable worst-case scenario unique to their particular needs. Personal protective equipment is paramount to staff safety. Keeping staff safe requires a work environment as free from hazards as possible. This is best accomplished through a combination of engineering controls and administrative practices, procedure changes, and the appropriate use of protective gear. Relying purely on the use of PPE is the least desirable option because of the dependence on the individual to select and consistently use the equipment correctly. In a hospital decontamination incident, one of the primary concerns of hospital personnel is the inadvertent exposure to contaminated victims. In this circumstance, your hospital has several choices for protecting you and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration requires they follow a predetermined and well-established hierarchy when determining which options are suitable for your facility. The first choice is eliminating the hazard. Unfortunately, this is not a viable option when one considers that hospitals are one of the primary providers of decontamination to victims of hazmat incidents especially mass casualty incidents involving the release of hazardous substances. The second option is to implement procedures that reduce the chances of hazard exposure. It is possible that this can be accomplished through the decontamination process, assuming that no direct patient-to-staff contact is necessary. If contact is necessary, then your hospital is required to provide you with appropriate personal protective equipment that effectively shields you from hazardous substances on the patient. You must also be fitted and trained with that equipment and in certain circumstances may also require a formal health evaluation before you can wear certain PPE. All of these safety measures are guided by various OSHA standards. A hospital PPE ensemble should provide the proper level of protection to establish a barrier between the hazardous material and routes of exposure to the employee. For example, PPE selected to protect from a material posing a dermal hazard would require exposed skin to be protected. A hazardous product that creates an airborne hazard would require protection of the eyes and respiratory tract as well as dermal protection in some cases. PPE typically includes a chemical resistance suit, inner and outer gloves, foot or shoe protection, and a respirator. This gear is designed to work in unison to shield an individual from chemical, biological, radiological, or physical hazards. Your hospital has selected equipment for your use and it should provide adequate protection as long as it is worn and used appropriately. It is your responsibility to become as familiar as possible with that equipment and practice using it on a regular basis. You must also become aware of its limitations because no combination of PPE guards against all hazards and its incorrect use can cause harm to the wearer. The level and type of PPE selected needs to provide an appropriate balance between risk and protection that still allows the wearer to accomplish their tasks safely and efficiently. PPE for hospital decontamination encompasses two major categories of gear, chemical protective clothing and respirators. Chemical protective clothing is designed to shield the wearer from skin contamination 
and the respirator protects against inhaling a hazardous substance. Chemical protective clothing typically refers to a specialized coverall type suit, two layers of gloves, and boots or flexible overboots to go over street shoes. There is a wide variety of protective clothing available. Your hospital should have chosen a clothing ensemble that will protect you in the most reasonably foreseen emergency based upon your local hazard vulnerability assessment, or HVA. A respirator is a device that protects personnel from inhaling a harmful substance in the form of a vapor, gas, dust, fog, or smoke. Some respirators protect workers in environments that contain dangerously low levels of oxygen. There are basically two types of respirators, an atmosphere-supplying respirator and an air-purifying respirator. Both types may include tight-fitting masks which require fit testing or loose-fitting hooded systems that do not require fit testing. Fit testing is a formal procedure performed to determine if an employee can maintain an acceptable fit when wearing a respirator since one size does not fit all. An atmosphere supplying respirator, also commonly called a supplied air respirator or SAR, provides clean breathing air from an uncontaminated source. The source of this air could be your hospital's medical air supply system or bottled breathing air. Properly used SARs provide the greatest level of respiratory protection and as a general rule are used by emergency responders working in conditions closer to the point of release of a hazardous chemical or when the toxicity of the material is so high that the responder must be protected from any exposure. Your local HVA results will indicate if this type of equipment is appropriate for threats in your area. In most cases, this level of protection is not necessary for hospital first receivers working in the hospital decontamination zone. Air purifying respirators or APRs filter ambient air by using a filter or chemical cartridge. This type of respirator does not provide oxygen and therefore cannot be used in an oxygen deficient environment. The filters are substance specific and often are only effective when the contaminant is below certain concentrations. Therefore, the wearer and the employer must be certain that the proper filter is being used, sufficient oxygen is present, and the concentration of the contaminant is within the effective filtering range of the respirator. Results from your local HVA will guide the selection of filters your facility has on hand. There are two broad types of APRs. One type uses the wearer's inhalation pressure or lung power to draw air through the filter. It is commonly called a negative pressure APR. It consists of a face piece worn over the mouth, nose, and sometimes eyes. A good face piece seal is critical in this type of respirator because any breaks in the seal will result in unfiltered air being inhaled by the wearer. The second class of APR is the Powered Air Purifying Respirator, commonly called a PAPR or PAPR. A PAPR delivers filtered air under positive pressure to a facepiece mask, helmet, or hood. While a facepiece seal is still very important, the positive pressure in the mask should result in air being blown out of any breaks in the seal, thus preventing the wearer from inhaling contaminated air. PAPRs have become popular because research by OSHA and the Best Practices document for Hospital First Receivers supports the rationale that this level of protection is adequate protection for workers in the hospital decontamination zone. The use of PAPRs also minimizes the administrative burden of other types of respirators, such as maintaining an appropriate air source and requiring annual fit testing. PAPRs can also be worn by people with facial hair and eyeglasses, and are usually more comfortable for people who are not accustomed to regularly wearing respirators. Another key concept of PPE is the application of varying levels of protection. These levels differ depending upon the degree of skin and respiratory protection provided. Various organizations have defined protection levels in different ways, but the most commonly cited method used in the United States is OSHA's level A through D designations. 
While you don't need to memorize these levels, you should be aware of their major differences. Level A consists of a fully encapsulating suit and a supplied air respirator. It is the most protective level and is often worn by on-scene hazmat responders. Level A is rarely used in the hospital decontamination setting. Level B protection includes chemical protective clothing that guards against splashes, but total encapsulation is not required. Like level A, a supplied air respirator is required. This is the minimum level of protection recommended for initial site entry teams when the hazard has not been identified or defined by monitoring, sampling, or research. Level C consists of the same type of chemical protective clothing as level B, but instead requires the use of an air purifying respirator such as a powered air purifying respirator. This ensemble is used when the inhalation risk is known or anticipated to be below a level that would cause harm to personnel and when eye, mucous membrane and skin exposure are less likely. In a chemical mass casualty incident where the identity of the offending agent may be unknown, a PAPR with a multi-contaminant filter can be used under certain circumstances. According to OSHA, the release site must be remote from the hospital and the lapse time between the victim's exposure and arrival to the hospital needs to exceed 10 minutes. The victim's contaminated clothing and possessions should be removed and contained quickly upon arrival and decontamination initiated promptly. In addition, appropriate planning and procedures should be in place supported with sufficient training and engineering controls. This planning must include a hazard vulnerability analysis and emergency operations plan that is updated yearly. If the contaminant is identified and its hazards properties evaluated, the level of PPE can be altered to meet the requirements of that particular hazard. In a hospital setting, Level D consists of a standard precautions ensemble using surgical gown, mask, and exam gloves. Level D PPE provides virtually no chemical respiratory protection and only minimal skin protection. Decon area support personnel typically wear this level of protection. Your hospital should plan to provide a level of PPE that can safely protect staff against exposure to hazards that may be released in your community. This information can be obtained from your hospital's hazard vulnerability analysis. The chosen level of protection should be made available to you and you should wear that level in most cases. Highly toxic agents unique to your community may require more specialized PPE and training. In certain circumstances, the level of protection can be downgraded depending upon the type of hazard, its concentration, and the risk of inhalation posed. For example, a patient contaminated with a skin hazard only will not require the use of a respirator. The level of PPE can also be downgraded when decon is performed outside, and procedures are in place that allow the contaminated patient to disrobe, contain their own clothing, and perform self-decontamination. In other situations, such as performing patient decontamination in an enclosed space, the level of PPE may need to be upgraded. In either case, the decision to downgrade or upgrade requires reliable and accurate information. When in doubt, wear the higher level of protection. The actual level of PPE necessary for hospital responders will also vary depending upon the degree of victim contact one has during an emergency decontamination operation. For example, a responder who has physical contact with a contaminated victim requires a higher level of PPE than a security officer whose primary function is to protect the area from other patients and visitors. The use of PPE may itself create hazards to the wearer. The equipment produces heat stress and impairs visibility, mobility, and communication along with causing a variety of psychological stresses, including claustrophobia. These problems are more commonly associated with higher levels of personal protection in which the responder is totally encapsulated within the protective gear. Due to the stress on the wearer of PPE, 
The decon unit leader must establish set work cycles and, if possible, plan on rotating out operations team members every 20 minutes with fresh team members. The proper selection of equipment and appropriate training, along with regular retraining, will significantly reduce these problems. Because of these potential hazards, employers must keep accurate training and medical records for all workers who utilize PPE. When using PPE, there are some basic maintenance and care issues to be aware of. Keep the selected and purchased PPE clean and secure it so it can be used readily when needed. Also, keep PPE dry and out of sunlight to prevent dry rot and ultraviolet light damage. Store PPE in a protective bag and place it in a secure area that is void of temperature extremes. Clean and store respirators after every use. All chemical protective clothing components are typically single-use items and should be disposed after use. Always inspect the PPE prior to use. Check the expiration date on the APR filters and when using a PAPR, make sure the battery is fully charged and flow checks performed. Regardless of the type of PPE or respiratory protection used, manufacturer instructions must be adhered to when using and maintaining this equipment. Also, because it is so important to practice and train with your equipment, it is critical that you maintain some training gear that is clearly marked and segregated from response gear. Properly deployed PPE reduces the risk of employee injury and allows first receivers to aid contaminated victims without spreading the contaminant to themselves or others. However, if improperly used, PPE can be as ineffective as wearing no PPE at all, resulting in injury or even a fatality. Because of the inherent dangers of improper use, it is very important to practice with your PPE and review all of your equipment manufacturer's information. Hospital staff interested in learning more about this and other important topics related to decontamination standards can download a copy of the OSHA Best Practices for Hospital-Based First Receivers of Victims from Mass Casualty Incidents Involving the Release of Hazardous Substances on OSHA's website, OSHA.gov.